Hey there, everyone. Welcome to this special edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for our show, especially today. We're doing a special all mailbag edition of The Final Bar. Again, we encourage you to send your questions into us via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. Of course, you can drop it into the comments section below our videos uh, here on our YouTube channel. It's been so great to hear from many of you, questions that you're running into on particular stocks and ETFs, getting into a lot of the uh, market structure questions about how stocks are actually trading, how ETFs are constructed, and of course, the technical analysis toolkit and the stock charts platform. Any of those uh, areas, uh, subject areas, are certainly uh, great opportunities to ask questions. So anything you're running into, as it happens, just shoot us an email, and we'll do these uh, regular editions of the, uh, of the show to answer some of these great questions that we received. With that in mind, let's get right to question number one in the final bar mailbag. Dave, I see a cup and handle formation forming in SMH. That's the semiconductor ETF. If you agree, how can I best take advantage of this? So first off, I would generally agree with that. And I initially, when I saw your question, I brought up the chart of the SMH and I'm like, eee, this doesn't really look like a cup and handle pattern. So I was ready to light in a little bit and just sort of lay down the law about what a cup and handle pattern actually means. And then I remembered, you know what, actually... The weekly chart of the SMH is a perfect cup and handle pattern. I'm guessing that's what you're talking about. Or if you're going back about two and a half years, you'll see this clear pattern. So I would say, yeah, this is definitely a great illustration of a cup and handle pattern for a lot of reasons. The general shape of this pattern is after an uptrend, uh, which is uh, step number one, right? You're sort of in an uptrend phase, and then you have this big sort of broadened, uh, broad bottom bottoming pattern. They call this a, a rounded bottom is sort of the, the technical way you refer to this. So you know, ideally, it's just sort of this gentle decline and then a bottoming phase and a gentle incline. This isn't too bad uh, relative or too far from what I just said. Then you have this shallower pullback uh, here on the right side. So there's your cup of coffee. There's the little handle. And then the most important part of this pattern is actually the trigger, right, which is, which is the breakthrough of uh, what's called the neckline or the rim of the cup here. So if you look, we hit around 160 in early uh, 22, late 21. We sort of returned round trip back to that 160 level here summer of last year. We then had the shallower pullback, which got all the way down to the 200-day moving average, and we broke above 160. There's your trigger, right? So until those things happen, right, until you have the rounded bottoming pattern after an uptrend, the shallower pullback, and then a breakthrough of the rim, until all those things are checked, you can't really call it a cup and handle pattern. You can call it a possible cup and handle pattern or a cup and handle-ish kind of pattern, uh, but until that trigger is confirmed, uh, you can't really call it a valid one. Now, here's what it actually means. So general way of thinking in the technical analysis uh, toolkit, when you have any sort of pattern like this, like a uh, double top pattern or a, uh, a head and shoulders pattern or a triangle pattern or any sort like that, you generally uh, speaking would take the height of the pattern and project that height from the breakout, right? So you take the rim of the cup down to the base, uh, the bottom of the base, you take that range and you sort of project that up. So, you know, loosely calling that like 85 up to 160, we'll call it. That's around a 75 point uh, rally, which means 235 would be the, the upside target. And that's just back of the envelope. I probably want to do it a little more uh, specifically looking at the levels. But that's generally what it's telling you. So if you think about it, that means we are just early on from the projection of this upside uh, of this upside breakout. So I would agree that semiconductor is in a bullish phase and really that breakout above 160 really cemented it. On the daily chart, you're seeing that sort of pattern, you're seeing sort of the right edge of the cup here. This is the rim uh, that we saw in the previous, or the, um, uh, the little handle in the previous chart, and then there's the breakout. And from there, we've had this pattern of higher highs and higher lows. So the longer term structure, I would 100% agree. I think the challenge to semiconductors here, like NVIDIA and AMD, and name any other semiconductor that's probably ripped to the upside recently, they're super overextended. And just look back for the last couple months, look at what happened in mid-November and mid-December. And again, we have a very similar pattern here in mid-January, late January. We're overbought. And, and that does not mean that the top is in and we're going to zero, but it does usually mean that we've had a really good run and you probably expect a brief pullback. And so the brief pullbacks in late November and late December, and I would argue probably late January, are going to make a ton of sense because they are uh, essentially the market getting way overextended and then pulling back a little bit. But what was key back here in early December and early January was we made a higher low. And that's what you're looking for, right? You're, there's no doubt that semiconductors will pull back at some point, either today or next week or at some point soon, 
I would be surprised if semiconductors don't take a bit of a pullback after the exceptional run that they've had really for the last three months. Uh, but look to see it uh, see it make a higher low. The 50-day moving average, often a really good uh, general guideline, right? Looking for a low above the 50-day would certainly validate that higher low, you know, higher highs, higher lows. That's a pattern that we want to see continuing. So uh, I would say long term, uh, certainly a strong chart in the short term. I'm skeptical of, uh, you know, upside, just given the fact that we haven't pulled back here out of this overbought condition. That's what I'd be looking for in the short term. Great question there and great, great thinking about, I hope, uh, multiple time frames, weekly and daily charts used together. Let's get to the next question. UNG, that's the natural gas ETF, went from $5 to $20 in a blink today. What happened? And we actually got this question uh, in the last week, uh, a couple days ago, and we had that, uh, had that occur. And I had the exact same thought process because I look at natural gas as, as part of my regular uh, morning coffee routine. I'm looking at crude oil and gold and natural gas and a couple other sort of uh, commodity ETFs and indicators before I go on to, uh, to other things. And I noticed the exact same thing. I mentioned this briefly on the show earlier this week, but I just want to reinforce uh, there was a split, right? So it went for a, a one for four split. So, you know, basically one day it closed around five ish uh, and the next day it opened around 20 ish. And so that was a split that occurred. To be honest with you, I think one of the frustrating things for traders and investors, there is no general industry, um, you know, um, industry accepted uh, formal method of uh, addressing splits, of communicating splits. They just kind of happen. And if you don't know they happen, all of a sudden it looks like something quadrupled in value like that. We do try to share those adjustments with you. So I would tell you a couple things that could help you understand what happened with, uh, with UNG. On the stock charts uh, page, go to charts and tools in the upper left. And if you go, actually, well, no, let's not do that. Let's go to your dashboard. That's a better way to do it. And if you look here on the left, you see where it says member tools. It's on the charts and tools page too, but I kind of like hitting it from here. Member tools, if you've not scrolled down in this little widget, I would encourage you to do so. Each one of these probably deserves your attention at some point. But if you go toward the bottom of the list, you'll find something called data adjustments right here, recent data adjustments on stock charts. You can always go back to that or just uh, bookmark this in your browser and come back to it. Any IPOs, any splits, any dividend adjustments, because we adjust our historical data by default anytime a company pays a dividend, uh, we store all of those and we actually share those every day on the screen here. Right now it's defaulting to IPOs, but you can switch to uh, splits, for example, and uh, we hit update, and you'll probably see right there, 124, uh, 2424 UNG, a one for four uh, split. You can also, of course, just type the ticker at the top if you know a particular ticker. You just want to know when uh, during the history there's been any sort of adjustments, and we'll list, them out, uh, we'll list them out that way. Now, you also can see on the chart itself when something like that happens. So if I go to UNG, and this is my chart of UNG, I'm going to give us a, UNG, I'm going to give us a little bit of uh, extra space on the right, which is what I usually like to do. Down below uh, Sharp Charts, there's this uh, section called Overlays, and we have this overlay called Events. Now, what's really cool about this is it will show you dividend adjustments, it will show you earnings, it will show you splits, and it pops up as this little indicator on the chart. So a lot of people actually have that as a default overlay on all of their charts. And then when you're looking at a particular symbol, you can immediately see when they've reported earnings, when there's been a big dividend, when they've had a split, and then the changes might make a little, uh, a little more sense. So that's why that one for four split basically quadruples the value from one day to the next. It's more of a structural change. It's not really a sentiment change of, uh, of any sort. We usually think of splits the opposite way. When a stock has gone up a ton, you'll have a split that actually goes down like a four for one split, which means uh, the value goes down by four. And that's often when a, the value of a stock gets really, really high and people will see it as too expensive and they, they bring it down. In the days of um, uh, you know, being able to trade fractional shares, which most brokerages uh, provide, the, the practicality of that adjustment is a little bit less. So I don't know if we'll be seeing as many splits as we used to. It used to be a pretty big deal because if a stock was too expensive, just people wouldn't be able to buy it. Uh, and so they would bring it down. This is actually a reverse split, a one for four split, quadrupling the value because the value of uh, the UNG was just so low. So that's what happened. You can use the dividend adjustments report or the, uh, the data adjustments report on stock charts if you just want to know if anything happened. Uh, also on your charts, I would encourage you to use that events overlay and that'll help you uh, reconcile on a chart. If something looks a little wonky, a lot of times it's a dividend or a uh, structural adjustment in the uh, share. Next question, how do you approach a chart like plug, which is plug power in this environment? Um, very delicately, I guess, is the, my initial answer, or, or not at all, would be my general first answer. That's my gut uh, question. You know, plug power, 
What a fascinating stock. And if you look at like the weekly chart, think about the trajectory. I mean, I still, when I, when I think of the ticker plug power, I'm thinking of 2020, right? Coming out of the COVID low, it's hard to find a stock that was more vertical, more exponentially rising than plug power. This was really one of those kind of arc innovation names I'm kind of thinking, right? Um, when every stock in that ETF just seemed to be doubling every other day, it felt like. Uh, and these were really coming out of the COVID lows. These are a lot of renewable energy names. Uh, obviously, a lot of emerging technology names all just seem to go vertical. And, and, and really, at the time, I mean, what a euphoric rise in that space. From there, I mean, plug power hit a peak in early 2021. And on the weekly chart, just look at this consistent pattern of lower highs and lower lows. Compare this to uh, the earlier chart of semiconductors. This is just that chart kind of flipped over, right? A consistent pattern of lower highs and lower lows, just the definition of a downtrend, according to Charles Dow. So the trend is down. So, you know, in my toolkit, I mean, you want to avoid charts where the trend is down, right? I want to find stocks where the trend is up and particularly where it's just starting to break out early, early days, uh, breaking out of a base. That's the type of chart that I would generally like to find. So this is more of a falling knife kind of chart, something that's been going down a ton. So you have two ways of thinking of, of a chart like this, right? Either you buy weakness and you're more of a value-oriented investor. You're okay buying thing that's something that's going down because you think it's undervalued relative to where it should be trading. So you're buying something that has a, uh, you know, a higher intrinsic value than where the, the stock is trading. You're assuming that the price is going to go up to match that sort of uh, intrinsic value of the, uh, of the asset. That's not the type of investing that I tend to, uh, tend to go by, but I get the argument. And if that's what you're looking for, I could see why you might be attracted to, uh, to plug power because it made a new low uh, right around here and it started to bounce up a little bit. I much more, if I'm buying something that has been weak for an extended period of time, I look for uh, signs of strength. I look for signs that this is no longer going down. I look for confirmation that early value investors are starting to accumulate shares because one of the best ways of determining that value investors are already starting to approach a name is because the price goes up, right? If a bunch of big value funds want to accumulate plug power, that demand is going to push the price higher and higher. And so the price itself will indicate that there's signs of accumulation. That's what I often uh, sort of look, uh, look for, signs of accumulation. What's happening right now is you have this pattern of lower highs and lower lows. We're below a downward sloping moving average. So first things first, I would want to see a break above the 50-day moving average. The RSI, which has been below 50 basically nonstop since July of last year, I'd want to see the RSI get above 50, ideally above 60 on a rally, because that usually sign, uh, shows signs that investors are accumulating. That's why for me, you know, back here in July, it actually looked like it might be an interesting idea, but then we never broke above the 200-day moving average, similar to where we failed there in February. So something in a significant downtrend, you're, you know, for me, I'm happy waiting and, and sacrificing those early gains, if only to confirm that the price is going higher. Because if you're thrilled about buying new lows, look at how many new 52-week lows there are on this chart well before the most recent one, right? It's just the latest of new 52-week lows we've seen all along the way there. So for me, I'd be looking for signs of accumulation. Generally speaking, back above the 50-day, the momentum improving, the relative strength improving. Weekly MACD is actually a usually interesting uh, thing to look for as well, because that MACD or PPO giving a buy signal often can indicate that those early buyers are, uh, are jumping in. So that's how I would approach this, uh, this chart. If you do get in early, by the way, if you're happy buying it now, I would just say make sure your money management plan is well articulated, meaning you have a very clear stop loss to minimize downside if the trend uh, continues lower. Next question. I'm perplexed that QTEC, QTEC, is handily outperforming the NASDAQ 100 dollar sign NDX. Is that due to QTEC being equal weighted? Fantastic question. I really appreciate it. And what I love about this question is it, it tells me that you are thinking about sort of the structure of ETFs. I've found a lot of times investors trade ETFs, something like QTEC, without doing, I think, an appropriate due diligence. There are general things you want to do before you consider any ETF in a portfolio. Number one, look at expenses, right? Because, you know, in 2024, it, you really have to, um, you know, be, uh, I, I guess, skeptical is one way to put it, of, of ETFs with high uh, expense ratios, right? At, trading ETFs is relatively inexpensive. So something that's more expensive, you really want to make sure that those expenses are justifying because that's something that comes out of your potential returns right off the top. Even if nothing else happens and the stock is flat or the ETF is flat, you're losing that initial investment because of the, uh, because of the expenses. Number one, number two is the spread, right? So the bid-ask spread. A lot of 
less liquid uh, ETFs can have a wider bid ask spread. So it might be trading at 185, but if you go to buy it, you're filled at like 195. That's not the case. FQTech is a pretty liquid uh, uh, ETF, so not an issue here. But with smaller ETFs, you'll find that where you see the price, you go to buy it, and all of a sudden you're filled way off of the last price. And that's the problem is just because there's not enough liquidity, and so they have a wider bid ask spread. So that's the second thing. The third thing is just the structure of it, right? What are you actually getting exposure to? What equities or, or uh, swaps or some derivative is being held by the ETF? And make sure you understand the structure of it. We don't have a lot of the structural data on ETFs. We have things like assets under management and those sorts of things. But really, uh, I would use a, a website like ETF.com is one that I've used. Uh, Coifin is another one that has good holdings data. I would make sure you, uh, you go there. I'd love at some point if we had some of that on, uh, on stock charts as well. But... Now we're focusing on, uh, on awesome charts for the moment. So to get to your particular question, you're perplexed that the QTech is doing this. I'm showing QTech relative to the SPY, but you were comparing it to dollar sign NDX. So what's the deal here? If the QTech is just giving me uh, exposure to the NASDAQ 100, how come it's outperforming so much in the last couple months? The answer is it's not exactly doing it. You, were, you hit on half of it, which is it's equal weighted. So the NASDAQ 100 is actually a cap-weighted index, right? So the Microsoft, um, you know, uh, Apple, Amazon type of names in an ETF uh, like the NASDAQ 100 are going to be huge weights compared to the smallest names. That's part of it. Now, we do have an equal-weighted uh, ETF. You could do QQQE is actually an equal-weighted NASDAQ 100 ETF, and you can still see that it's been outperforming by so much. So the other part of it is, if you look at the name of the ETF, there's your hint. First Trust NASDAQ 100 Technology Sector Index Fund. The QTech actually just holds the technology stocks within the NASDAQ 100. So it's big weights on uh, like Apple and Microsoft, um, the, uh, you know, NVIDIA, right? The, the technology names. It doesn't hold communication services names or others, right? Like a Tesla or Alphabet or Meta. Those are not in the CTF because they're not in the technology sector, right? Um, and so uh, if you look 90% plus of the, uh, of the, NAS or the uh, F uh, QTech, is uh, technology sectors and, and, and other random things that might be uh, you know, uh, labeled some other uh, sector. The NASDAQ 100, of course, has other sectors that are represented, like consumer names, uh, communication services, and other sectors. And the technology names, particularly the AI-driven names, have been so dominant. That is the main reason why QTech is outperforming the NASDAQ 100. It's basically the technology part of the NASDAQ is outperforming the other part of the NASDAQ, even though overall they're all doing quite well. So there's your answer, and I would say, uh, you know, I appreciate your question because it tells me that you're really thinking about what exposure you're getting from those ETFs, and I would encourage you to, uh, to dig deeper and, and really look at the equities that the ETF is holding. That's a really good way to understand the weightings and the exposure you're actually getting. Next question. How did you create the performance chart you showed recently? And this was a really uh, good question earlier, uh, and it might have been this week or last, uh, last week. I forget what I was uh, actually looking at, but I used this particular chart style called uh, performance. And it gives you something like this. And I think I was doing like year to date returns. So I went here and I was showing something like this. And I, don't even, I don't even remember, unfortunately, what I was showing, but probably something looking at growth over value uh, because that's what I've generally been thinking a lot about uh, here in January of 2024. Um, you had mentioned I go to performance and I'm getting something uh, totally different, right? I'm, I'm going down to... Um, a, a chart list and I'm looking at the performance view and I'm getting something totally different. And you're right. Uh, these are actually two different things. When you're thinking about performance, there's a couple ways you can do it on the stock charts platform. I'll show you this one, which is one that I've created. And then I'll show you some other options uh, as well. This is actually a chart style that I created because I wanted to use our sharp charts uh, uh, workbench and I wanted to show the relative performance over time of a series of stocks or ETFs. And so I created this template which basically uses the performance chart type. So most charts that you look at are called uh, like bar charts or candle charts, right? So you're looking at a price bar like that, and sorry about the other lines on here, but if you say type performance, that is just a chart, uh, st a chart type, uh, which is basically looking at percent returns from wherever you start to the current uh, price value, whatever date range you set uh, below here. So. I basically created a chart style using that performance type. And then below, I actually add these indicators called price performance. I add the ticker. Make sure you say behind price, pick a nice color, and then you get this view where you can look at QTech or whatever you have on the chart. And then you have these other ones. So I'm looking at uh, mid caps, uh, basically mid caps, small caps, and micro caps 
along with whatever ticker that I put in there. And I did that so that I could bring up something like the NASDAQ 100 and look at how it's performing relative to mid cap and small cap and micro cap uh, names. So it's basically using a series of different uh, uh, chart styles together. Um, so the way that you do that, basically recreate that. If you use the uh, settings that I have here uh, on, my, uh, on my workbench, you can recreate this uh, particular chart. Uh, and again, make sure the type of chart is called performance. Now, what you were referring to is a different thing, which is I'm looking at my list of uh, charts. And let's say I go down here to like global equity in, uh, ETFs and I say view as performance. This is actually a performance view for a list of stocks or ETFs. When you have a chart list, you can actually look at this performance table, which is a way of just showing in a tabular format, how have all these things done year to date? And I can see on this group of global ETFs, Japan number one up 2.6%, the S&P number two up 2.3%, and I can see all of these different ETFs and how they've performed over a different time frame. It's a really good way of just identifying with a group of things what's done well and what's done poorly. And I think of this as a great way of making sense of a big list of stocks or ETFs, put them in a chart list, look at this performance view. But in terms of visually charting performance, I like that chart style that I created uh, on the Sharp Charts workbench. I would encourage you to have one of those uh, as well to compare the performance of one thing versus other things, a benchmark, uh, other parts of the market, and uh, so forth. Next question, is it correct that with RSI, the average up day and average down day values both change every day? And I boiled that question down from a long and detailed question. I appreciate you sharing all the details about your, uh, your, your attempts to understand the RSI indicator, what it's telling us, how it's calculated, and all of that. I mentioned earlier this week um, the, uh, the, the RSI indicator. And just as a reminder, um, go to Chart School if you're trying to learn about any particular technical indicators. I mean, the, the amount of information we have that is available for free is, is breathtaking, in my humble opinion. And when I was learning technical analysis in the early 2000s and just trying to understand it, I literally came to this website. It was an earlier version uh, of this uh, of chart school on stockcharts.com. And, and this is one of the ways that I really uh, began to understand how some of these indicators were, were derived. If you're looking for something particular, just click on the magnifying glass in the upper right corner, type RSI or whatever indicator you're looking at. Make sure here you're looking at chart school. And uh, here's the article I would look at, relative strength index or RSI. It'll mention how Wells Wilder created this indicator and he was really using it to um, uh, anticipate turns in commodities. He was looking at the commodity space in the 1970s, and RSI is one of the many indicators that he created. Uh, it will point you to his book, New Concepts in Technical Trading Systems, where I actually can see Wells Wilder's handwritten uh, sheets in an accounting ledger where he calculated the indicators by hand and show you where, where they were. It'll also refer you to Connie Brown's book, uh, which was part of the CMT curriculum when I took the CMT exams. Uh, Connie Brown and uh, Andy Cardwell did a really fantastic job, I think, growing and, and building on uh, the use of RSI. And they talk a lot about the range of the RSI, which is something I refer to often. That was, uh, I initially learned of that from, uh, from Connie Brown and Andy Cardwell and their work of thinking about um, you know, RSI and how those ranges may be uh, an important part of uh, your assessment as well. But it also includes the actual formulas that we're using. We actually have a spreadsheet to show you Here's what, actually, uh, here's what you're actually doing. And I mentioned in the show, and I'll remind you here, when I was just learning technical analysis and started getting into technical indicators, one of the things that I was uh, forced to do, is the way I would describe it, by my mentor at Bloomberg, was to open Excel and literally download price data and hand calculate, or I guess calculate in Excel, prove out the different indicators, and I would match them to what I saw. Uh, I would encourage you to do that. I learned a ton about the math behind them, really helped me to understand how similar certain indicators were and how different other ones were, and that helped me to think about which indicators I needed to have on, uh, on my chart. So if you look at the calculation, basically here's the thing. Um, RSI is based on a calculation of the average up day and the average down day, right? Or average gain and average loss over X days. And RSI 14 is the default. Uh, and so basically, um, you know, it's 14 over the last 14 days, what was the average up day and what was the average down day or how we describe it in the article, the average gain versus the average loss. So that's a rolling 14 day window or every day that you do. So every day you're looking at a new set of days. So you have a new day being added, but you also have a day 14 days ago that's rolling off. So that's why every day the average up and down usually changes in some way, although it doesn't have to. It depends on whether they were up days or down days and what's being added and what's being rolled off. There's also an exponential calculation, and that's that first uh, item. So that RS ratio of up days to down days is actually this guy right here. The actual value of the RSI uh, basically takes the previous 
uh, uh, observation and then uses this exponential calculation to show the uh, to show the proper uh, actual reading. So the RSI does use an exponential calculation uh, that makes it a little off from just the pure up days versus uh, down days. So that's how the indicator is derived. And again, the math behind it was, uh, was designed by Wells Wilder in uh, the 1970s, just because he created, he wanted to create a way to identify turning points. And his initial uh, use of the indicator, as you'll see in the book, is basically overbought and oversold conditions, which makes sense because a lot of commodities pretty volatile and mean reversion is the game, right? So if you're trading those, if you're a swing trader, you're selling strength and buying weakness, and the RSI was designed to capture that. Nowadays, when we're looking at equities and ETFs, we can use it for a lot of other things. And again, I would encourage you to review uh, Connie Brown's book where she gets into a lot of really good uh, 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 approaches of how to use the ranges of the RSI and uh, other indicators to have a more effective analysis of trend versus momentum. There's your answer. Next question. I loved your breadth indicator episode, and thanks for that. We, we enjoyed putting that uh, special episode together. How do you reconcile strong markets despite weaker breadth indicator, right? Uh, and, and really interesting question. You asked about some of the recent uh, um, uh, discussions that we've had. I'll go to the Mindful Investor live chart list here and bring up, uh, you know, the number of these, right? Like the percent above their 50-day, the bullish percent index. You know, we've highlighted how a lot of these are really, I would argue, disagreeing with the price action. Um, and while we did do that breadth indicator episode where we dug into the construction of some of these indicators, I would refer you back to some of the conversations I've had recently. Just yesterday, I was talking with John Kosar of Asbury Research. We talked about breadth conditions and how they were related to um, you know, market conditions at part of his Asbury 6 macro model. Uh, and one of the uh, negative uh, parts of that model, the bearish parts of that model at the moment, are the breadth conditions, which are not particularly uh, supported. We talk about the slope of the advanced decline lines not matching the slope of the uh, S&P going higher. We talked about indicators like the McClellan oscillator already giving a sell signal, stocks above their 50-day moving average breaking down. Here we have the bullish percent index breaking below 70. You know, bulls right now, and I do follow, I mean, I, I try not to follow too many other analysts just because I, I need to focus on my own content and what sort of charts I'm talking about. But I do pay attention and have conversations with my peers in the industry. And I know a lot of bulls right now are, I would argue, kind of ignoring the negative breadth conditions or, or would tell you that it doesn't matter, right? The, the, the market's going up, so it doesn't matter what is happening with breadth. And, and indeed, they're not wrong that the fact that the market has gone up for months and months driven by that narrow leadership. And I talked with uh, John Kosar about that yesterday, uh, last week. I remember Adam Turnquist of LPL Financial. We talked about that discrepancy between, you know, basically large caps and small caps. What does it mean that small caps are not participating? I, I firmly believe that even though that is true, there are times when the market can go higher on uh, with a small number of huge names doing the lion's share of the gains. I would be much more comfortable as a bull here if breadth was improving. And that's what happened in November and December, right? Breadth was improving as the markets were rallying. That's pretty good. What happens when the market has gone up a lot is a lot of times these breadth indicators get very overheated. And I don't think this means, you know, the S&P is going to retest 3,600 necessarily, right? That's not what this chart is telling you. It does tell you that we've gone up a lot. Most stocks are now going up. And now all of a sudden you're starting to see that lightening up. And when stocks are breaking down, maybe not the largest names, but when other names are breaking down, that tells you that investors are rotating out of those. And what it seems to me is they're rotating out of the speculative stuff. They're rotating, rotating into the, the defensive characteristics and the, uh, and the upside potential of, uh, of blue chip uh, growth names, right? The, the leadership names that we've talked about, including semiconductors and, uh, and other things like that. I don't think that's a bad thing for those names, but I think it does tell me that we are probably due for uh, more of a pullback than we've seen so far. And between divergences and breadth coming down, uh, divergences in terms of momentum divergences, I'm skeptical of, of huge further upside beyond current levels uh, without more of a pullback. And, and, and the breadth conditions being what they are as part of that, uh, as part of that thesis. So, you know, for me, again, I'm, I'm just skeptical of uh, a further upside given the breadth weakness. Uh, and I'd encourage you to go back to some of those guests where I posed that exact question just to hear how they were thinking about it. Uh, a lot of the same themes that I just mentioned. Next question. I have massive gains in stocks like PANW, that's Palo Alto, NVIDIA, Adobe, ANET, Arista, and uh, Broadcom, AVGO. How to avoid dr huge drawdowns here? Uh, yeah, great, great question. I mean, so number one, congrats. I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled uh, if, you, if you do own something like an NVIDIA 
or, um, or Broadcom or some of these names. I mean, they had incredible runs. And, and literally any one of these uh, have had really strong moves in the last 12 months. And if you bought them 12 months ago, you're probably feeling uh, just fantastic about the run that they've had. No, 100% agree. You know, the danger to charts that have had a really good run is at some point, and, and, and 100% of the time, stocks have come down in some way, not, not often to zero, right? I mean, stocks don't go away, but the best leading names that you've had often have drawdowns. If not, I mean, they always do, right? It's a question of timing that. So here's the way I would think about it, right? So you have the leading indicator part of the toolkit, which basically says, help me anticipate when a top may be coming. And then you have the lagging part of the toolkit, something that might confirm that a top has already occurred. And I, I would say the technical toolkit kind of has a little bit of both. And I would encourage you to use a little bit of, of both of those sides of it. The leading indicator part of it would be look for uh, something to be overbought. And a chart like Palo Alto has been overbought here uh, for the last week and a half or so. Just coming out of that overbought region potentially today with the RSI coming back below 70. That often indicates, again, not that it's the end of the world, but maybe we have a tactical pullback, right? So mid-December, we became overbought. We became overbought in late November, by the way. Ended up making one more high, and then we came out of that overbought region. We ended up, ha ended up having a pullback from around 320 down to around 280. Uh, you know, not the end of the world, but pretty big drawdown, actually. That's, a, that's not a small number. It's not, an inf it's not a zero. No, that is a, that's a meaningful number. That's a drawdown. It looks like this little blip, but that's a pretty big 40-point move on a stock trading at 320. So it shows you the volatility that's probably not clear from, uh, from the chart. So we just had that same pattern here. Uh, that, you know, for me would tell me, all right, maybe we're at a, at a pullback phase. I would say other things uh, like, uh, you know, home builders and others uh, have had clear divergences, right? Higher highs in price, lower peaks in momentum. That's another sort of leading indicator telling me, all right, we might be near the end. We're in like the eighth or ninth inning and not the second or third inning of that trend. And you have to remember, just like in a baseball game, you can't go to extra innings, right? You can, uh, or in, uh, if you follow soccer or football, right, you might have... Uh, uh, extra time, you might have additional uh, time uh, because it's a, it's a tie. So it doesn't guarantee that the game ends and the, and the trend is over. Uh, there are times when it becomes a little more extended, but it probably tells you we're near the end of the, uh, of the game or the, uh, or the end of a match. So one part of it would be leading indicators. Look for signs of overextended. I would say on a lot of these technology uh, leadership names, you've, you've started to certainly see that. The other uh, idea would be have more of a lagging approach, right? Look for the stock to break down through a particular level. Uh, look, use a trailing stop of some sort to try to lock in those gains and minimize losses. You know, in terms of trailing stops, right, something like the 50-day moving average is, in essence, a trailing stop, right? Holding a stock as long as it holds an ascending 50-day moving average can be a good, uh, good way of, uh, of doing it. We break below the 50-day, then maybe you lighten up a position or maybe you take some profits uh, because we've had an initial drop. And, and while there's no guarantee we go a lot further, there's a risk that we just continue. It's just the beginning. And so lightening up a little bit can help you uh, minimize uh, downside. The RSI, does it break below 40 on a pullback? Because uh, in a bullish phase, the RSI tends to bottom out around 40. In a bearish phase, we tend to get a little bit below there. So look back here where the RSI often got way below 40. So looking for that sort of thing. The other thing where I would encourage you to get to, um, you know, using a, a trailing stop, two general ways of thinking about it, use a percent stop, right? So off the highs, take like seven or eight percent uh, percent off the highs. Uh, we have an easy way of doing that. If you click on the, where is it? Here we go. Percent change tool. I'm just going to make it a color that we can all see. There's your uh, high. Go down about eight percent. That would get us a level right around there. We'll call it 325. I probably want to zoom in on this chart. I'm just doing this for, uh, for time. Uh, keeping it uh, keeping it tight. So putting that level and just looking, uh, making sure we stay above it or get to the chandelier exit, which is where I would often uh, often encourage people to want to get to. If you're not familiar with that, this is in, uh, in an approach popularized by Alexander Elder in one of his books uh, where he talks about, uh, I think it's the new trading for a living. He talks about chandelier exits, which is basically uh, based on average true range and it's a trailing stop indicator, kind of a, a, a supercharged version of some of the trailing stops that I mentioned uh, there. So I would do that or uh, just click on the magnifying glass type chandelier exit and we have some articles explaining what that is, how to use it and how to use it on stock charts. Next question, how will AI change stock charts charting the market and technical analysis overall? I love this, uh, I love this question. This could be the subject of a day long uh, offsite that maybe I will, uh, I will create at some point. I'll let you know when that's happening. You guys can all fly to uh, Seattle. We'll have a, have a good discussion on the implications of AI because it's a meaty topic. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, uh, books uh, by John Markman uh, that come to mind uh, where he talked about 
uh, basically uh, thinking about longer term trends like AI. You know, when I'm thinking of AI, you know, a lot of people have speculated, right, when AI comes out, I'm like ChatGPT comes out, I was told, okay, that's the end of written commentary. We can use AI to do videos. So, you know, someone like me who writes a bunch of articles and records a lot of videos, where's my future because AI is going to take it over? I would say, boy, we are so far from that. I mean, if you look at videos that are created by AI, it's usually pretty easy to know that that's what happened. If you, if you look at articles written by AI, there's actually some noticeable differences. There's often uh, some personality missing and, and, uh, and just unique perspectives. So I would say the reality and the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, I guess, the futuristic view and the reality view of here in 2024, there's a gap there that's uh, it's, it's a lot farther than you probably would expect. AI has a lot of issues, even though, uh, you know, a lot of the companies are going up. Down the road, AI can do really cool things. I think today it's still probably pretty far behind. I mean, we're not at a Star Trek computer type of AI uh, anywhere near that. What will it do to technical analysis? You know, I would think of the same, the, the uh, analogy I like to use is with bank tellers. I remember when ATMs were, um, you know, really becoming more and more uh, uh, proliferated in like the 90s. Speculation was, okay, um, you know, bank tellers will go away. We won't need bank branches because all we'll need is an ATM. If you look around, I don't know about you, but there are more bank branches now than there ever were, it feels like. Uh, and the reason is because you still need to go to a bank to do things. It's just bank tellers have a different uh, role, right? Their role is more... Uh, you know, more therapeutic, more conversational, more consultative. They're helping you buy a house or, you know, open accounts or do some big important things like, uh, say, for college, uh, whereas an ATM is just transactional. So the transactional stuff is, is done with a computer, but you still need a human being uh, to do that. I would say with charting, I don't think that means the role of the technical analyst or that you won't use charts. I just think your job is going to get a lot easier and you'll be able to focus your time on other things. Ralph Akampora, who's actually going to be in our office here in Redmond uh, next week, uh, we'll uh, hope to have, feature his uh, conversations uh, and share them, uh, share some of those with you. His job back in the 1960s was hand drawing charts, and luckily I've never really had to do that professionally. The charts have been created, so computerization of charts didn't get rid of my role. It actually just made my role easier because the charts are ready, and I can focus on uh, analyzing them. I'm thrilled for what AI can do for helping us identify ideas, for helping us set alerts and scans uh, more dynamically. Uh, be able to filter through large amounts of information, help us think about which charts we should focus on. All of that AI certainly has a possibility to do, and I'm uh, very much excited for the prospects for that. So the roles will change as they, uh, as they often do. Final question. I'm trying to improve my technical analysis skills. I've noticed a guitar hanging in your background. This is probably when I'm uh, doing it from home. I have a guitar, I think, off my right shoulder. Do I need to take guitar lessons? Great question to wrap up our special uh, mailbag uh, episode here. I'd encourage you to do so. I, I, I'm actually trained as a musician, and uh, you know, studies have shown learning a musical instrument, just like learning a language, uh, doing all sorts of uh, exercises that really stretch your brain in, in ways you probably are not used to doing. So I would encourage you to do it. There's a whole subculture within the technical analysis community that are all musicians. I know, uh, you know jazz drummers and uh, successful guitarists and others that... Uh, that are all in the technical uh, analysis community. And actually, the CMT event in Mumbai uh, back in 2022, we actually had a jam session. Uh, Tyler Wood, who's a drummer, and I had a trumpet. And then we had three uh, traditional Indian musicians. And talk about a fascinating challenge, trying to speak the language of music. What a great testament to the universality, the universal language of music that we were able to actually jam together. We just had to figure out how to speak the same language musically, and then we were able to have fun and play together. Same thing with technical analysis is indeed a universal language. I've attended conferences with others and where language was a huge barrier, but we were able to communicate in the language of charting uh, very, very well. So uh, I would encourage you to pick up an instrument and uh, dig one out if you haven't done so uh, in a while. But other than that, I encourage you to stretch your brain. And I hope that using the stock charts platform to learn about technical indicators and uh, trend analysis can help stretch your thinking as an investor as well. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us for this special all mailbag edition of The Final Bar. I'm Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Be well, stay safe. We'll talk to you again soon.